Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rob Gregg and I'm a Consulting Systems Engineer on the Cisco Cloud Security team. Um, I'm going to be running this session today in place of Paolo Passeri who's been unable to, to make it along. So today uh, we're going to be talking about ransomware, a little bit about um, how it works, the sort of uh, the flow of an infection from ransomware and then also how Cisco Umbrella, Umbrella is able to help you here. So. Um, what we're seeing here is, um, you know, pretty pretty typical ransomware. I'm sure um, a few people on this call have run into something like this um, uh, in their day-to-day in -day lives uh, recently. Um, essentially, what ransomware is, is it, it's a type of malware which, when it detonates on your machine, begins to infect um, your files, and then it demands a ransom um, to to um, uh, so un unencrypt your files. So ransomware has been incredibly successful. Uh, it's by far the most profitable malware in history. And there's, there's a number of things that have, um, have caused this. Um, but the key one um, is the ability to sort of monetize this. Um, the, uh, the, the rise of, sort of cryptocurrencies, the like of like Bitcoin, has made it so these attackers can extract ransom and payment directly from their, um, their victims. So in the first three months of last year, um, cyber criminals collected um, over $209 um, uh, million. Um, and by the end of the year, it was actually over a $1 billion um, industry. Um, looking only at, um, at ransomware delivered through the Angler exploit kit, um, there, it was, um, we've estimated that they were making somewhere in the region of about $60 million a year in profits. So it's really big money. Um, like these, there's entire industries that have popped up supporting this. Um, the economies on the back end are very, very large. And as a result of this, there's been you know, quite a lot of I mean, innovation, I suppose you'd call it. So let's have a look at the evolution of these variants. So the very first ransomware variant was all the way back in 1989. Now, we call it ransomware. It's not really in the way we think of it today. It wasn't encrypting all your files. It wasn't demanding a Bitcoin payment, but it was popping up and saying, hey, I've removed access to these files. There was really simple ways around that. Um, and there's been, there's been antivirus since, um, some fake antivirus since then, various other um, uh, types of malware. Um, the big key date in ransomware as we know it now is right here. So at, in, in 2008, Bitcoin was launched. So a little bit about Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is a decentralized currency that allows for completely anonymous transactions, allows for payments that can't, can't be tracked by either the person who's being paid or the person who made the payment. Now this really changed things. Um, it, gave the, um, it gave attackers the ability to extract pretty mean, meaningful income from them, these sort of attacks. And as such, you know, they exploded. And the early versions were, um, weren't quite as successful as the things that came later, things like Ransom Lock, Dirty Decrypt, these things won't, probably won't have heard of too much. Crypto Locker was the first big winner. The reason for this was they had very, very strong encryption. It was, um, it was all but impossible to decrypt their, um, uh, uh, your data. Uh, it was followed by things like Crypto War, Crypto Defense, a whole bunch more. There's been an absolute explosion in, the, um, in these things since about 2014. Uh, barely a week goes by now about some new variant of, um, of these things um, popping up. Um, the big ones over the last couple of years have been Locky, that was absolutely everywhere. And um, Samsung was, was, was massive too. I saw quite a, quite a lot of server as well, and that still seems to be on the rise at the moment. Server is something I'm seeing a lot more in my um, my day-to-day -day work. Um, but the, the what, what we're trying to say here is that these things are only getting more and more popular, and you know they're not really going to go anywhere. So let's talk about typical infection and how that looks. So um, essentially, you get you have your infection vector. So this tends to either, either be the internet or email. So either you're browsing around and you hit something, or you get an email that has something attached to it. Once that um, that, that um, file downloads on your system and detonates, it makes a command and control um, a call to a, a, a server that is hosting the key, downloads an encryption key, and then all your encryption your files become en encrypted and are held hostage. Next step um, is that the person running this attack um, makes a request for ransom. So we see this anywhere between um, sort of half a Bitcoin and um, uh, I think the highest I've ever seen is three, three or four Bitcoin in, in, the, in the wild. I'm sure there are, are higher ones out there. Um, bearing in mind that Bitcoin is sort of somewhere around the $1,000 mark at the moment. That's not an unsubstantial amount of money. 
Um, just go back, in fact. Um, there's a few things you can do here. Um, but the first option is obviously you pay the you pay, pay the ransom. That can be really expensive, uh, particularly if this thing's jumping around your network. We do see these um, these inspections jumping onto network attached storage now, and then obviously the charge for each decryption things start getting very expensive very very quickly. The other option is you know you recover from backups if you have them. That's great. However, you know there's a cost there anyway. You're you're losing um, time from your staff um, uh, recovering those um, uh, those backups. You're losing efficiency from your users while they're not uh, not able to work. The third option is you lose your data. Um, I think we all know that that's not really um, an acceptable solution to these things. Talking about the actual infection vectors again, though, you see the vast majority of these are using DNS. As you know, this is a Cisco umbrella-led um, uh, meeting. Of course, we're going to bring a bit of um, DNS into there somehow. Um, this is the top 10 um, uh, uh, ransomware variants of the last few years, and um, Lockheed being you know, the biggest. The vast majority of these are using DNS um, for encryption keys. So you can block these requests at the DNS layer, then you can, you know, you, you can prevent that encryption. And you notice that's not, not the case for all of these. SAM SAM actually doesn't have any command and control calls at all. It has an inbuilt um, uh, encryption key. You know, we can't block 100% of everything. What we can do is give you the best coverage that's, that, that's available in one package. So let's talk about the actual flow of these. Let's first of all talk about a web-based infection. So your user um, clicks on a link, or they hit a domain that's hosting some uh, malvertising. This tends to bring them to something called an exploit kit. An exploit kit is um, a sort of piece of ma malware that essentially scans your system and looks for vulnerabilities in software. So we're talking unpatched versions of Java, old versions of Internet Explorer, things like that. Um, once it finds um, uh, some vulnerabilities that you look to be vulnerable to, it'll then download um, uh, a payload. Now, 99.9% .9 of the time, these payloads are, are ransomware these days, but for the reasons we've discussed, the next step would be um, uh, a call to a command and control server and the encryption key downloaded. Data encrypted, files inaccessible. Um, you know, not what you want, uh, want in the middle of a work day. Pretty much the same goes, goes here for, the, um, uh, email, for uh, infection by email. So you receive an email with a malicious attachment. That ransomware payload detonates, and then there's a call to an encryption server, uh, to a command and control server for an encryption key, rather. Um, you, your files are encrypted, and then they're inaccessible. So let's talk a little bit about how, how Umbrella can help. So there's several points here where DNS and IP connections are being made. So first of all, your users, let's, let's we'll stick with the web browsing example for now. Your users are browsing the internet. They're hitting a domain that's um, hosting an exploit kit. So that is a DNS request. The request for the domain hosting the export kit is a DNS request. Umbrella can block that DNS request. We do a lot of very interesting analytics, we'll touch on a little bit later on, and that allow us to be very effective at predictive blocking of, um, of, um, uh, sort of access to export kit domains and other malicious, you know, malicious domains. So we're talking drive-by downloads, malvertising domains, things like that. So once that, um, but let's, let's say that gets through. Let's say you hit this export kit domain. In this case, we're looking at Angler. Um, once that, um, that scanned your system and made a decision about what's the best piece of malware to um, uh, install, that then makes another DNS request. So that's out to the malicious um, infrastructure that's hosting that file, the file that's, um, that's then going to download into your system. You need to go to that infrastructure to be able to download that. So Umbrella can stop that there too. That's another DNS request. Um, once the file has, let's say that's, you get through there and the file makes its way onto your endpoint. We still have that point there where the, the, the file detonates and it makes a call out to a command and control server to download that encryption key. Once it downloads that encryption key, data encrypted, bad day, as we've discussed. So I just want to give you an idea about how we do this. Um, Cisco Umbrella is one of the world's largest um, recursive DNS services, the second largest after Google DNS, you know, second to Google in a big data race, not too bad a situation to find yourself. We see somewhere in the region of 80 to 100 billion DNS requests a day. Um, we have users across 160, uh, 160 countries. We have 85 million active users. This is people actively using our DNS, um, uh, recursive DNS service every day. We have somewhere in the region of about 12,000 enterprise customers. So this data is the power of Umbrella. This is really the secret source in how we do what we do. From this, we get a very good, broad view of what's happening on the internet at any given time. And we can run analytics on that view. We can start making decisions based upon things like, you know, how we see hosts affected after they first hit a domain. Do they then start hitting lots of, of malicious looking domains? Um, 
what have we seen hosted on particular IPs before? So if you make a request for a brand new domain, we can look at the IP that's hosting it. So all sorts of different data points we can use here. And this allows us to be very, very effective when blocking access to these sort of, um, uh, these sort of malicious locations on the internet. So the difference here between Umbrella and other security services is how we see attack, um, cyber attacks. So if you look at many other security services, they're going to be, they, they see the beginning of an attack as patient zero. So that first infection point, the first file detonating on a system and starting to do some nastiness. From there, there's a few steps that follow that up. So first of all, you have your patient zero, then you have an expansion. So you start infecting more people. Widespread scale prevalence is absolutely everywhere. That's the point when um, many sort of, you know, if you're looking at traditional um, sort of, uh, uh, antivirus companies, for instance, they'd be building defense signatures. It's a little bit late in the game. To get the, the, the malware's already out there, it's already infecting people, it's already causing trouble. However, from the umbrella point of view, we actually think that this is halfway through the process. So before you get to this point, before you release your, your malware, before you make your first infections, there's a bunch of things you have to do. Obviously, you have to build the malware itself. But on the back end, when you're looking at your hosting and your infrastructure, you have to start registering to net domains, looking for parts of the internet to register in, setting up um, servers, buying IP space, um, uh, starting making announcement, public and private announcements about, that, um, um, uh, about your infrastructure. And then you start doing little tests. You tend to start seeing these little, little, little spikes just before large scale attacks, which is basically malicious actors testing their infrastructure. So we can see all of this before the first, um, that first infection even happens. And as a result of that, in a very large percentage of cases, we're able to block um, and to, to start blocking this infrastructure before any infections have actually taken place. So we're seeing where these attacks are staged. Now we have this huge data set, these 100, um, 80 to 100 billion DNS requests a day, which amounts to about just somewhere in the region of about 3% of global um, DNS traffic, a little bit less than that. Um, now we're using sort of big data analytics um, and some really interesting algorithms and some machine learning techniques to identify these threats in an automated manner. Um, and that's pretty key to how we do things here. Um, you know, if you look at a lot of traditional security companies, they have you know very smart, very dedicated, very um, very uh, sort of proactive security staff manually looking into these things, identifying malicious um, domains, identifying malware hashes, identifying hosting hosting infrastructure. We go, we go about this a little bit of a different way. We take an automated approach. We use this large data set and we use the analytics we run that data set through to identify these things in an automated manner. It allows us to be a lot more effective against these sort of modern, much more agile uh, security threats. So I'm gonna, we're gonna take a real world example. So this is a domain um, associated with um, the Lockheed School of Ransomware. Um, so we first categorized this um, uh, on March 15th, um, 2016. So you'll see here, this is a graph of traffic towards the, um, this domain. You should probably say what we're looking at here is we're looking at um, a tool called uh, Cisco Umbrella Investigate. Investigate is essentially a window into our, our intelligence. We'll give you all the data we have about any domain, IP, malware hash, um, autonomous system, various other things. And um, we'll give you all the information we have about that in a single, single plane of glass. So what we're seeing here is um, uh, an exploit kit, kit, kit domain that was um, uh, distributing the Lockheed School of Ransomware. As you can see, um, this is a sort of activity pattern towards this domain. Not very much here, and then a sudden spike up on the 15th. So this is then beginning to, to start a new campaign. You'll notice here, this is exactly when we block this. Now here, this URL, this is, um, uh, this is something that we got from a third party when they identified a, a, a particular URL that's hosting this instance of Lockheed. You'll notice the date there, but we're gonna come back to that shortly. So I want to talk a little bit about how, how our system did this. Um, so what we're looking at here is a screenshot um, from a tool we call Open Graffiti. It's a data visualization engine. We essentially show you the connections we see between domains, IPs, who is email, name, name servers, and the actual malware hashes hosted on these, um, these parts of the internet. So this is um, an Open Graffiti model for this GLS Lindia domain. So domains that are in red here would be automatically blocked by um, uh, Cisco Umbrella and OpenDNS. If you were to point your traffic towards, um, towards us um, and buy our enterprise products, we would automatically block access to any of these. The yellow, domain, the yellow entries here are um, malware hashes. 
So these are actual uh, representations of um, piece of malware that have been downloaded from these domains. And the white bits here, you'll see, this is actually a URL where these pieces of malware were, were downloaded from. So this is a, the, the specific URL found on third party tools. In this case, it's, um, it's virus total, which I'm sure some people on the call will have heard. So um, what we're seeing here, you can see these connections between these two. So this first one, which I am not even going to attempt to pronounce, is um, co-occurring with, um, with the GLS Linea um, exploit kit domain we, we mentioned. So what do we mean by co-occurrences? A co-occurrence is a domain that's called within a few seconds before, a few seconds after a domain in a statistically significant number. Um, so our system can see this because we see such a good percentage of global DNS traffic. Um, we can say, okay, the, you know, 100% of the users hitting this first um, difficult to pronounce domain are then immediately hitting this domain. So this domain has been compromised and is um, now hosting um, an exploit kit that's being, uh, it, it, um, it, being hosted actually here. As you see here, this is in the investigate product, we show you this. These two domains co-occurring in 100% of cases. So the interesting stuff here comes with um, uh, uh, what we did next. So we saw these three, all these domains which share the same infrastructure. Let me show you what I mean by that. Um, well, we'll start again here. So this is the infection point. This is the users hit this domain are immediately redirected to this exploit kit, the, this distribution point. Now the interesting thing here is that these domains are the next uh, distribution points. So how did we know that? We knew that by looking at the IPs hosting these domains. So you can see all three of these domains are hosted on this IP address here. And they're also all hosted on this name server. So what we did here um, was we, we saw this first infection. And then in an automated manner, we began to block the rest of these because we saw that these were sharing infrastructure. We saw that, the, saw that they were sharing hosting. Um, and as a result of that, we were able to make sort of intelligent, automated decisions about what to block next. So this, these, um, uh, this exploit kit domain, next up, jumped to this, this domain, and next up, jumped to this domain. By the time those were blocked, we'd already had all those blocks. We blocked all of these um, domains at the same time as we blocked this first one. And it is about that sort of bird's eye view, visibility of everything that's happening on the internet at, at any given time. So as I said, and you'll notice here that the first virus total submission for this domain um, was on the 18th, so that's three days after we were able to block this, um, this attack. So, how could you make the most of this intelligence? Um, our product umbrella is a very, very simple tool to, um, tool to run. Um, it's uh, very simple to deploy and very, very simple to manage. So I'll give you a quick run through of exactly how simple we're talking here. On our simplest level of deployment, um, which we call networks, you can be covered by simply entering the name of your network, entering the IP address that a DNS request is going to egress to the internet from, probably not that IP, um, going to your local DNS servers and then forwarding requests onto Umbrella. It's as simple as that. Absolutely everything on your network will now be protected. It's a very, very quick, very, very effective way of protecting yourself against these, um, these attacks. So just to give you a little bit of a um, sort of anecdotal example of, uh, of, of a real world use of us to block out ransomware. I had a recent case um, in mainland Europe where we had an educational organization who was seeing anywhere between sort of you know, five and 30 ransomware infections every single day. It's the worst example I've ever seen. Now, they're an educational organization and they were just coming up to exam season. They were concerned they were gonna have to um, uh, sort of cancel their exams to, um, uh, to, to, so they didn't have to risk the, um, the, the results becoming in, uh, encrypted and then not being able to retrieve them. So we jumped on a call with them in the morning they deployed by the afternoon. Um, within within half an hour of them jumping off the call, the call they deployed across their entire organization. And in the 30 days we ran a trial with them, they saw one ransomware infection. So that was down from up to 30 a day to one over that 30 days. I mean, we can't stop 100% of everything. Anyone who says they can is selling you snake oil and you should run a million miles. But what we can do is be very, very effective against particular types of threats and particular threats that other types of malware, other types of um, uh, malicious actors are. Uh, are not so effective against. So this is a very, very quick way of seeing this, this coverage. We also have the ability to um, uh, prevent, pr protect your off-site users uh, very easily and very effectively. This is our, our endpoint client. It's available for Windows or Mac. You push it out to your endpoints and all it basically does is sit there, force DNS requests to go to a Cisco umbrella, and then you know, block the ones um, that, that are being made to malicious infrastructure. So again, very, very simple, works for Windows or Mac, very lightweight, and in most cases actually improves performance. 
Um, and that's one of the key things with Umbrella. It's very simple to manage, but you get this very effective coverage. You get this very um, uh, uh, you know, quick, easy um, to, to deploy um, security without you know, any sort of slowdown in, in performance. Our, our, our DNS network is excellent and tends to actually speed things up for users. So uh, we'd encourage you to um, spin up a trial here. Uh, we're very, um, uh, it's a very lightweight product, really simple to deploy. Um, we have um, 14 to 30 day trials that can be deployed in very little time and you'll see a large amount of um, protection against these, these sort of, uh, these sort of um, attacks. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to say, see if anyone has any questions here. Does anyone on the call have any, anything they'd like to bring up, anything they'd like me to drop into our investigate tool? Um, please, feel, please feel free to drop that in the chat. While we're waiting to see if any questions come up, I'll just give you an example of the, one of these um, uh, ransomware command and control domains. This is one of the reasons why they've been so effective. They have these really short life cycle domains. This is um, a domain that's been used for command and control for the um, crypto locker ransomware. Um, so essentially, this is why they've been so effective. You see, you see domains they always tend to look at this. You'll see a very small amount of tra traffic or absolutely zero traffic, then a sudden spike, and then they'll die, and you'll never see anything significant to them again. So what they're trying to do here is um, work around in, uh, sort of reputational-based security products, things that you know look at domains and have to research them. So if you're a um, reputational-based product, you might first see the domain, say, here, about halfway through the attack. Um, you might confirm it's malicious here, push it out to your endpoints by here, by which point it's not going to be very effective. And this is, I mentioned there's been a few things that ransomware has um, done to become so effective. One of those has been, you know, that, that, that Bitcoin and the ability to monetize so effectively. But this smart and sort of agile uh, hosting infrastructure is, has been pretty key to it too. So the difference, there's a question about the difference between the software client and the IP, um, IP networks uh, in, in, in the GUI. So um, there's a couple of differences. So the first thing is that obviously um, uh, you can go off-site with, uh, uh, with the client. You know, that client's on your endpoint wherever you are forcing DNS requests to go to Umbrella, but it's also tagging them with some information so you know, um, so we're able to associate this, this with your machine in particular. Um, so you get that off-site coverage um, with, 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 without the need to VPN back in. The other thing here is that while, that's, uh, while the, the network um, level is very, very quick to deploy, we don't have any granularity. So as I said, you know, you point all your traffic to, um, to our resolvers and everything from that IP, we're going to associate with this identity. So that's great. It's really, really thorough, really, um, uh, uh, really good coverage. The problem with that is that um, we have no good way of identifying which hosted uh, request is originating from. You might have a thousand users behind this IP. We're going to call them all NYC office. So the, um, the the roaming client gives you the ability to get more granularity around that. See which users actually making the request. So just. There is an, uh, there, uh, there's a question about whether we're going to include Umbrella in the AnyConnect client as a plugin. We actually already are. Um, so the way that works is, uh, as, as you can see on screen here, the beauty of this is that when your users are on VPN, uh, they're going to see the benefit of, the, of your VPN. You know, you're, you're connected to, back to your um, home network. But when you're off VPN, the roaming client then kicks in. So you still get sort of policy um, application, uh, visibility and security for your users, even when they're off the VPN. And you know, having worked in IT before, I'm, I'm very aware that users don't turn on the VPN if they don't have to. So there's a question about, does the tool, tool come with an automatic notification tool? It would be good to report on effectiveness of the tool, but it would be far better if this, this could be automated by email. So um, there's a couple of methods here. We do have some um, automated re reporting capabilities. Um, where essentially you can build up a report and uh, you can automate that with, within a particular um, uh, time period. However, that would be you know either daily, weekly, monthly. The next option there would be we do give you the ability to output um, reports into an Amazon S3 bucket. So um, you could build something in, in, internally to automatically report upon you know, sort of botnet and malware uh, requests that are being made. And you could pull that data out of the S3 bucket and you know, build something internally. You'd have to script it, but it's, it's possible. We don't have anything built into the dashboard itself right now. 
Uh, the next question is, some firewall vendors have DNS signature-based protection and DNS sync calling. Does Umbrella Replace improve on this level of protection? Uh, yes, it does. Um, our intelligence is a lot more... Um, a lot more real time and a lot more. There's a lot more to it. So we 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 basically use all these correlations. We use all these different data points connected to each other. We do this real time analytics. We do all this interesting machine learning stuff. That's how we um, go about building this. And we do it in a very different way to those um, uh, firewall uh, firewall signatures. The key thing here is that we're, because we're cloud, you know, we, we we're based on data centers around the world. We're 100% up to date. So as these new, new, really agile attacks spin up, um, you know they're only around for a very short amount of time. They're not going to make it to your firewall by in, in time for um, uh, for them to really be protected. We can do this in real time. So the question is, what about um, protection from DNS requests that have already been locally cached? Um, so we can't do that. Um, yeah, you know, we wouldn't be able to. I mean, but if they've been locally cached, then it means you've been there before, and they're, they're probably going to be relatively okay. I mean, it could be that you know the, the the host has been taken over, but yeah, that's that's not something we can help with too much. Um, and uh, there's a question about what stage is ransomware at when it comes to um, mobile devices, iOS and Android, etc. So there's nothing for iOS. Um, a few instances have been appearing for Android. Uh, they're nowhere near as complicated or and as advanced as what we're seeing in in Windows machines and and to a lesser extent in Macs. Um, now we can protect against them anyway. If you're connected to a network, if you're connected over Wi-Fi to a network that's um, covered by Umbrella, we could um, uh, we could then provide um, coverage upon that and, and block block that. Now, my suspicion is we're going to see this more and more on mobile. Like I, I'd be very surprised if we don't start seeing more and more ransomware for mobile. Um, and I'm sure the environment will continue to change as and when that happens. So the next question is: Does um, CWS, um, the Cisco Web Security ScanSafe product? Also share the same information as Umbrella with regards to block domains. It does not. Um, we we have totally separate um, information now. Talos, the wider Cisco security and intelligence team, do share do um, hit our API, but they don't have all our intelligence in real time. It's that we wouldn't be able to because of the nature of our technologies, it'd be tricky to do that. Um, so the the answer there is no. Um, and the key thing is that they we'd have to push them out. Um, uh, the answer is no, essentially. And the way the way our technologies work, it's be tricky for us to do that. Okay. So next question is: Is the Umbrella DNS platform um, is the Umbrella DNS platform complementary, or for example, on my Cisco Meraki network gear, or redundant? Complementary. Um, I mean, there's stuff that we can see that, 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 that they just won't, and it's all about the analytics of the data set that we have. Um, the beauty of, of Umbrella is because it's DNS, it's delivered at the DNS layer. We can deploy it anywhere. Um, we can um, absolutely um, layer over any security products there with, with, with you know, zero additional latency. Any anyone in the world that's using DNS, um, we can protect upon. Um, the next question is: Is Umbrella integrated with AMP? So we pulled some information from AMP Frequid. Um, we uh, we use that to improve our intelligence. Um, one of our products, one of the things that we have in our product is we have what we call integrations. So this gives us the ability to pull data in from uh, third-party products and use Umbrella as an, as an enforce, enforcement point for them. So we can actually do that with Cisco and Frequid as well. So if you have an AMP Frequid um, uh, 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 deployment, then we can start pulling domains in from there and enforcing upon them. I actually think AMP and Umbrella are, um, are perfect bedfellows. They, they, they look at the files. We look at the network connections. And the next question is how easy is this is this to set up and deploy? So as I said, like you know, the network level. I mean, Cisco actually deployed Umbrella glo globally, um, and it was a two-minute change. Um, took a couple of hours for it to push out to all, all, all the networks everywhere. Um, but it was, it, you know, it's two lines of code. They had to just change the DNS uh, IPs. You do that, you register your IP addresses, and you're done. So the next is, what's the key message? to try and sell this tool to customers who already have a degree of DNS protection on their existing firewall. Push the intelligence is the key here. Um, our, our intelligence is um, much better than anyone else's out there. To be able to build what we have, you need a global DNS infrastructure. The other great thing here is that you know it's so simple to deploy and so simple to manage. And the um, uh, um, and um, yeah, we, we completely we cover all ports and protocols, so you can push us put, push, put us up against proxies and things like that, because you know they're really limited in what they will and won't cover.
Um, so I think that's the end of the questions we've got there. Um, so feel free to follow up. Um, my, my email address is uh, rob.greg at cisco.com. More than happy to answer any further questions there. Um, and um, yeah, thanks a lot for your time today.